Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Growing up, I received a lot of unorthodox advice. A family friend from the church, he tells me that my big plan to go to college is a waste of time. Uh Uh-huh. That what with the end times upon us and everything, right, right. That what I should do instead is to join him going door to door selling knives. Really though? I get to think, I, I I don't know because maybe that works okay for him. But for me, a young black man knocking on people's doors in Grand Rapids, Michigan, holding a set of steak knives, I'm going to have to pass. From the local deacon, he tells me that my soul is in danger of corruption from wanton women. Wanton women? Well, if you see any wanton women, please let me know where they hang out. I'll see if I can resist their powers. He says I'm not taking the divine threat seriously. Mrs. Henry warns that the only books I ever need to read are all written by our Pastor General Herbert W. Armstrong that I should toss all other reading material into the trash. But just the thought of my dog-eared copy of The Hobbit sitting in the dumpster it brings real tears to my eyes. Middle Earth feels far more real to me than Grand Rapids ever does. Frodo, Gandalf, Samwise, Ganji, these are my best friends, my truest compatriots. And don't worry, I bow to each and every one of them. As long as I draw breath, this shall not pass. Looking back, it occurs to me that I received lots of advice from well-meaning people, people who are not trying to do me any harm. People with hearts of gold. But it turns out you don't need any license or knowledge or even basic sanity to tell other people what you think they should do. And that's why today, from WNYC Studios and Snap Judgment's Orbiting Hall of Justice, we proudly present Misguided. Amazing stories from real people who might need a second opinion. My name is Ben Washington. I get all my advice from Dr. Phil. Because you're listening to Snap Judgment. We begin in 2013. When adult-ish podcast host Nige Turner, Nige thought he was about to have the summer of his life. But Nige's dad, of course, had different plans. Take it away, Nige. So August is my favorite month. Every year, my family goes on an African-American-themed cruise called the Black Cruise. Just picture your regular cruise, replace shuffleboard with a basketball court, Switch out chicken strips with jambalaya and get rid of whatever wheat cruise ship acapella group and insert Fantasia. And this year, the cruise departs from New Orleans. But the morning that we're set to depart, I wake up to a text from my dad. Meet me at the hotel lobby dot 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 now dot dot dot. You know how old people text. When I get down, I'm surprised to see my dad wearing his famous mowing the lawn sun hat and my uncle Al. I'm surprised to see him, too, in his not-so-famous New Balance walking shoes. Immediately, I know I'm in for something. What's going on, Dad? Don't worry about it. I see, I see. A little father and son and uncle bonding time. I'm with it. A luxury tour bus pulls up to the curb. 
and suddenly all these people pile out of the hotel and start boarding. So we're going on a wine tour. My dad, uncle, and I hop on last. As I'm walking up the stairs, I see a digital sign above the bus driver's head. Plantation tour. Wait, what? This is definitely not planned by the black crews. And to make things worse, there was not a single black person in this bus of at least 70 people. Mostly white, the rest Asian. The only seats that are open, thank God, are in the front row. We sit down and I turn to my dad. Yo, we're really going to a plantation? Like, on purpose? I've never gone before. To be honest, even though I believe it's really important to learn about your family's past, slavery is something I'm comfortable only reading about. The bus driver, an older black man, must have overheard what I said because he turns around. I was thinking the same thing. Y'all the first black people I ever seen on here. Then the bus driver starts driving. So to your left, we have sugarcane fields. Now, most people, when they think about slavery, they think about cotton picking. But most wealthy plantation owners converted at least half of their land into sugar. Everyone was so intrigued. I even see a young white guy with tortoiseshell glasses writing in a notebook. Was he taking notes? On what? How to run a plantation? The bus driver quickly interrupts my thought with, Who here loves the movie Django? You know I raise my hand. And when I look around, no hands. I slowly lower mine. All these people are going on a plantation tour, taking notes, and have never heard of Django? Well, on your right, we have the Candyland Plantation from Django. I start to hear the oohs and ahs. The person behind me comments on the beautiful outdoor staircase that leads from the front garden to the balcony on the second floor. The phones are out. I hear someone say, look at those tall white pillars. I turn to my dad. Hey, say what you want about them slave masters, but they can sure build a house, huh? My dad just rolls his eyes and keeps listening to the tour. So we finally get to our intended plantation, and the place is creepier than the bus ride. The employees at the plantation are walking around in full 1800 slave master fits. To my left is the big house, which is the term that the slave owners actually refer to their own houses as. And then to the right, about a hundred yards away, are the slave quarters. And right in front of the slave quarters was a gift shop and a restaurant. A restaurant that I hear is known for its all-you-can-eat pancakes. The overall vibe is far too festive, touristy, disrespectful. Everyone seems to be doing a lot more reminiscing than reflecting. While I can't help but look at the way that the Spanish moss hangs and sways off the trees, I think about the bodies that likely did the same over this ground. It also reminded me of my dining room back home, where we have in picture frames the actual slave bill of sale papers from my dad's side of the family. It's hanging right next to a picture of our family today. Apparently, my dad's ancestors kicked it at the same plantation that Nat Turner was at. That's why my last name is Turner. So looking at the Spanish moss hits me in all sorts of ways. Because being here on this plantation, I can almost imagine slavery happening to me. It's hard to put into words, but... Nigel! My dad breaks me out of my trance. I run and catch up to the start of the plantation tour, which is right by a mint julep drink stand. I'm surprised to see a young black woman working at the station because she's like the only black employee here. The idea of getting a celebratory drink for this occasion was stupid, but at this point, seeing another black person feels like home, so I walk over. My dad, too. Uh, I guess we'll have a mint julep? She looks at me. Bourbon or rum? I look at my dad to call the shots on this one, but he just shrugs. Even though I'm not allowed to make 21 and up decisions, I confidently reply, uh, let's go with the, uh, bourbon. While she's making the drink through some type of black telepathy, I try my hardest to communicate how strange this place is to the employee. But message was not received. As I'm walking away, I quickly double back and say, this is weird, right? And before I can even finish my sentence, she goes, weird as hell. We begin the tour. 
Our tour guide is wearing a long tan suit jacket and a white shirt with frills on it. Nervously, he says, um, I just want to say by no means are we condoning what happened. We are just showing people the history of this land. It seems as if the tour guide is looking for us to pardon him on behalf of all black people. So my dad, uncle and I nod. The big house is still in great condition. Even I catch myself marveling at the architecture for brief moments. The way the ceiling is beautifully hand-designed, white borders that match the borders on the floor, leading to the fireplace with so much detail. Then my eye catches an extremely worn-down spot in the corner of the room. What's that over there? Oh, they would usually have a slave boy that stood there at every meal, pulling a rope the entire time to activate a fan over the dinner table. My palms got really sweaty. He continues the rest of the tour, but none of it really sticks. I'm zoned out. How many slave boys stood there for hours, pulling a rope to fan the room? I now wish that I didn't ask that question, that I didn't notice that spot. Like how I almost forgot to notice that if this is a slave plantation tour, how come there aren't any employees dressed as slaves walking around? I start to feel lightheaded, as if I might faint. Then I find myself being dragged outside. The next thing you know, I'm at the back of the big house with my dad. Just me and him. He says, Hey, you good? (laughs) Yeah, I'm fine. It's just a lot. He nods, saying, I know, it's crazy seeing how our family was treated worse than animals, isn't it? Then he looks at the big house, then at me. Underneath his mowing the lawn sun hat, a devious smile grows on his face. He takes a step forward towards the house, first staring at the ground where his feet sink into the dirt, then scanning the house intensely. His face says one shot of curious, two shots of scared of what these walls have seen. Then he looks back at me and says, Hey, spit on it. What? Out of all the things that he could have said in that moment, that was the furthest from my mind. Spit? Yes, the house. Spit on it. Uh, I don't know. And I swing my head to look if anybody's around. No one. Then he starts doing the... (laughs) Puts his back into it, harks up a huge loogie, and... Honestly, that was the most disgusting thing I've seen my dad do. But as soon as he did it, it felt like the air got easier to breathe. My dad's laughing like a mischievous kid and says, Now it's your turn for all the people who didn't get a chance to spit on it before. So I get the biggest loogie that my throat can muster, put my back into it, and spit on the house. Suddenly, My body feels lighter, and I can't stop laughing. I know spitting on the house is not that big of a deal, but it felt like a secret I had from the plantation. My rebellious little Nat Turner moment. All right, Nige, let's go. This is the last place I'm trying to get left at. My dad and I get on the bus, greet our bus driver, and look out the window the whole way back. My dad leans over and says, you can't let that happen, Nige. I'm confused. Let what happen? And as soon as the words left my mouth, I knew what all this was for. Leland Turner, notorious for his over-the-top teaching methods. You know what I always say when it comes to you and your brother, right? I'm raising lions. I'm raising lions. You can't let anyone make you feel smaller than you are. You'll feel this more when you get older, and I know you feel like I'm a little extreme, but when situations arise later in life, I want you to be able to see it for what it is. Don't let any surroundings shrink you. Always spit on the house. Always.
Thank you, Nige, for sharing another story on the snap. Please let a brother know where that plantation tour is so I can take my own kids one day. That piece was brought to you by Adult Ish, a culture, advice, and storytelling podcast about adulting. It's co hosted by Nige and produced entirely by the young folk at YR Media and Snap Judgment alumni, Davey Kim. So stop what you're doing. Subscribe to their show, adultishpodcast.com. The original score for that story was by DJ Clay Xavier and Stanley Ipkiss. Now, after this short break, find out how producer Stephanie Fu lives in the virtual world. When the misguided episode continues, stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Isle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. From WNYC Studios, welcome back to Snap Judgment, the misguided episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and for our final story, we send our own Stephanie Fu on assignment into the digital realm. Snap Judgment. My dad and I didn't have much in common when I was growing up, but we did share one hobby computer games. We'd play games together where we'd decapitate monsters with names like Putrid Defiler. Now you die. So when I started playing The Sims, he didn't get it. The Sims, for those who don't know, is kind of like playing with a hyper-realistic dollhouse with many people, or Sims, living their everyday lives. I already have to wash dishes and pay bills in real life, my dad would say. I don't need to do it on a computer game and he'd go back to looting villages. But that's just why I liked it. I liked controlling these little people, making them do grown-up things, getting jobs, making money. Okay, let's be honest, I was 12. Mostly I just like to make them woohoo, which is what it's called when two sims have intimate relations. (laughs) I also liked doing things like buying leopard print sofas and starving my children to death. Which sounds heartless, but I'm going to blame my behavior on the game. Sims were almost impossible to feel personal affection for. The Sims AI was pretty terrible back then, and it was hard to actually like your Sims because they were so dumb. You just want them to cook breakfast, and they'd set themselves on fire. If you didn't tell them to go to the bathroom on time, they'd pee all over the living room. And so, after I started to think the funnest part of The Sims was manipulating them to commit suicide, I threw The Sims away and didn't play the game again. And it wasn't long after that that I stopped playing computer games entirely. As I entered adulthood, I learned what actually being a grown-up was all about. It was about making money and maximizing productivity. I work a lot. Sometimes I don't have time to eat, let alone play video games. In fact, I probably would have never played the game again, unless work asked me to. Snap assigned me a story about The Sims for this episode. While I downloaded the newest iteration of the game, The Sims 3, I read the game's message boards. I was disappointed. A lot of the users were saying The Sims were still super dumb but I did get a little rush when the game started and I heard the classic, kitschy theme song. One of the first things I noticed with the new Sims is I could make a Sim that looked like an Asian girl, and I could even give her an outfit with clothes really similar to ones I have in my own closet. So I decided to make a Sim me, a Sim Stephanie. When it came time to build her personality, 
My boyfriend helped me pick traits similar to my own. Sim Stephanie is ambitious, very excitable, and of course, a workaholic. One of her life goals is to be a journalist. And then I saw that the Sims had free will now. There was this slider where you could control the amount of free will they possessed, so they could be more independent and do things like use the bathroom without you telling them to. I gave Sim Stephanie the maximum amount of free will. Then I made a Sim boyfriend for her, who resembled my own boyfriend. The first thing I did was I suggested Sim Stephanie flirt with my boyfriend Sim, and thankfully they started getting really into each other. And then, right before they had their first kiss, my Sim excused herself, ran into the next room, clapped her hands, and did a happy dance. Before returning to make out. And this is super embarrassing, but the thing is, I actually did do that in real life before me and my boyfriend's actual first kiss. And then Sim Stephanie continued to do happy dances about many things getting a phone call, bedtime, her waffles. I laughed, but a dark, shameful part of me recognized her behavior as familiar. I started to get self conscious. Is this how people saw me? I look ridiculous. I mean, God, waffles are super good, but I. I think maybe I need to calm down about them. Then, Sim Stephanie got her first journalism job. She wanted to be successful so badly that after she came home, she'd still write articles late into the night. But it got to the point where she'd be writing at midnight, and then she'd be miserable and exhausted all of the next day. She'd show up late for work. She'd take it out on her boyfriend. I tried to get her to stop working and go to sleep, but she wouldn't listen to me. So I'd start yelling at the screen, What is wrong with you? You are screwing yourself over! Until I realized, Wait a second. I did this in real life, yesterday. This was getting creepy, like some meta-nightmare where I had to watch a bird's eye view of all of my own flaws. In a manic moment of paranoia, I wondered if somehow a chain of meta-meta juju existed, where perhaps there was an uber Stephanie watching me and facepalming herself over all the stupid stuff I do every day, yelling, no, no, don't eat those cheese fries, you will break out, no, ugh. Eventually, though, Sim Stephanie fell into a groove, balancing work and life. And her relationship with her boyfriend actually started to resemble my own in this really comforting way. She'd work late, but since he was less work obsessed, he'd play guitar into the night, serenading her and making her snacks. I kind of felt like I appreciated my real boyfriend more watching it. But what was the deal here? Everyone on the message board said that The Sims 3 AI was terrible. So I went back and reread the comments from the disappointed users. None of the parents got a single promotion. My Sims will spend a lot of time woohooing, like three or four times a day. I discovered my Sims flirt with people who aren't their partner when I'm not controlling them. Unhappy face. Sims have always had problems surviving or doing anything without help. The message from the developers is clear. Free will is a very, very bad thing. Control your sims at all times. And they did. Many of the players took away their sims free will. Not really because the Sims 3 AI was bad, because it was so good. They saw themselves in their sims and they didn't want themselves to fail. I thought there was something incredibly dark about that. I don't believe in fate myself. I like to believe that I control my own destiny, so I thought I was above that. I wouldn't take away Sim Stephanie's free will. Until one night, Sim Stephanie had been working really hard for several days and her happiness levels were low. She desperately wanted to have fun. 
she started playing computer games to relax for a couple hours. But I knew that if she completed this one task by tonight, she could get a promotion and a huge raise tomorrow. I thought, we could really use the extra cash. I thought, I'd like her to be a little more productive. And that little slider was just begging to be slid. So I turned off her free will, and I forced her to finish her work. Sim Stephanie did what she was told, but her happiness plummeted. She sat there, resentful, exhausted, miserable. And I knew exactly how she felt. I felt like I just punched myself in the gut. I had taken away Sim Stephanie's free will as punishment for playing computer games. And I was playing computer games right now. I was supposed to be so much smarter than Sim Stephanie. Sim Stephanie stayed up all night once because she couldn't find the bed. But even she knew that finding the next big story was not worth sabotaging her own happiness. Even Sim Stephanie knew that she didn't need any more fancy couches. Sim Stephanie knew how to be a human, knew how to be a happy grown up, better than I did. She, I, we know now. That happiness, it comes first. And sometimes it's okay to just relax. Maybe even play a computer game. Thank you, Stephanie Fu. Original score by Leon Morimoto. It's that time. And if you missed even a moment of amazing, life-changing storytelling, do yourself a favor. Subscribe to the Snap Judgment Podcast. Fly your snap flag high. And if you like what you heard, or if you hate it desperately with a furious passion, let me know on the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook. Look for Glenn, G-L-Y-N-N, Washington. You'll find it, the fabulous-looking black man. And if you like your storytelling in the dark of night, in partnership with Luminary Media, get the Snap Judgment Presents Spook Podcast, all new 26 episode season. Be afraid. Snap Judgment is brought to you by the team that will never leave you alone to wander in the middle of the street. Make some noise, if you would, for the best Boy Scout ever, the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich, Pat Racine Miller, Anna Sussman, Renzo Gorio, Shana Sheedy, Liz Mack, Eliza Smith, Leon Morimoto, Laura Newsom, <gasps> Marissa Dodge. Flo Wiley, Nancy Lopez, John Fasile, Nika Singh, Teo Ducat, and even though this isn't the news, the Oasis news. In fact, you could rent a recording studio, hire the best producer, sing your heart out for your debut album, only to realize no matter what mama says, you are a horrible singer. It's terrible. You could do all that, and you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is W-N-Y-C.